So who does decide it, it go through? It's the athletic department. It's the school. It's they decide how it is that that as that they're going to allocate their their resources, right? They got to buy land. They got to build a softball facility. They've got to right. They've got to do all these things. They've got to hire a coach, etc. Next slide, please. Okay, this title. Oh yeah, does it ever require schools to take opportunities away from men and give them to women? I've never, 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 never. Schools can do that. That is a choice. Back in the 1950s, when Brown versus Board of Education came yeah. out, and uh, 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 communities had swimming pools and golf courses, and schools chose to close those facilities rather than integrate. Goes up to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says that's okay as long as it's equally bad for everyone. So schools can make these really terrible decisions, but it's not Title IX's fault. Title IX is a civil rights statute. It cannot um, keep schools from making bad decisions. It uh, all it can do is get equality between men and women. Don't men's sports make the money? Shouldn't they get more? Yeah. So I have answered this question more times than probably any other question that I get. But usually they don't say it nearly as nicely as Mason just did. Usually they say it very snarkily, like, duh, they make more money. Okay. So remember sports, when schools are offering this, these are educational opportunities. This is the same thing as math class. And if you can't discriminate in a math class, because some of those students are going to to uh, build a patent. Let's say that um, only Caucasian students built, uh, had a patent. Um, um, you couldn't deny the rest of the student body with opportunities in that math class. S same thing with, um, with uh, if you had a donor that said, you know, I want this, I want to give you money and I want you to build this facility and um, only white people can go into this building. No people of color can go into this building. Well, duh, the school can't do that. Um, they can't accept money that would just, so when a school wants to give money to one program that, and because sports are sex segregated, they are giving to either men or to women. So the school has a responsibility of making sure no matter what the source of the funds are coming in, that they provide equality, okay? Over the last 10, 15 years, we've just seen this huge explosion of revenue dollars uh, for sports. Part of that has to do with how media is operating right now. There's people don't fast forward, they actually watch the commercials. And so it makes the commercials much more valuable. So we've seen this a ton of more money going into sports and mostly where it's going <laughs> into the back pocket of a very few number of people. It's going into coaches and athletic directors uh, it is not going to make things equal. So it doesn't matter where the money comes from, okay? With donors, sponsors, television rights, ticket sales, COVID budget, co there are no justifications for treating women like second-class citizens. Title IX was passed in 1972. In 1975, the Department of Education passed regulations mandating schools be in compliance within three years. Why are so many schools still not in compliance with Title IX 49 years after it was enacted? It's depressing. <laughs> um, it, it, it is because nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to be the one to require schools. I mean, what I would say, the adults in the room, right? So the NCAA used to have a rule called certification that required, if you want to be a member of Division I, you had to provide gender equity. And as soon as Mark Emmert, the current president, came on board, he did away with certification because it was getting in the way of him making money. And you see when he came on board, how the gap between men's and women's programming grew. Why must current students be the ones to take legal action? Why can't former students, parents, coaches, or donors take legal action? <laughs> yeah. So they can take legal action when it comes to uh, filing a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights. But that's part of your course today on, uh, on law. Janine is gonna go to law school in the fall. And one of the things you learn is like, who gets to bring the lawsuit? And it usually has to be a party with real interest in the matter. Um, that's why it has to be a current 
enrolled student to be able to bring the, 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 the lawsuit, to be able to bring legal action against the school. Um, my question is, what does a student need in order to file legal action? Um, yeah, you need um, usually a group of students uh, who are willing to uh, put their name on the case and uh, they need a lawyer. And the lawyers that we work with, number one is we make sure that they have what they need to be able to bring the case. Um, there are um, there are lawyers doing nothing but employment law right here in Jacksonville. I guarantee you, there's probably not a single attorney who's ever done a Title IX case. So, right, so we give them sample pleadings and sample everything. So we make sure they're really good litigators. We make sure that they're resourced enough so they can keep the light bills on. Sometimes the cases go really quickly. Sometimes like the school like says, you got us, oh, you caught us. And they, they fold and it's a couple of months and you get a huge whopping change. And other times, like we saw with Cohen versus Brown University, they just um, you know stall and are annoying and do everything that they can. Again, it's one of the few times when the facts and law are really clear. Most of the time they're not, um, but but they'll still argue with you. So so you got to make sure that the lawyer can stay in the game because if they can't, then um, then you know then then they'll, they'll like oh you put a fence around the women's softball field good and they get their check and they're gone so we need to make sure that the lawyers who are there are in it for the right reason that they can get the system-wide change not just teeny tiny little increments what are the steps to taking legal action so after you reach out to us and we we, we have a list of attorneys we janine and i have been going around to different attorneys and kind of getting their okay, it takes them a while. Like they've got to go get the, the they, they've got to make sure that they have the financing to be able to do it. Um, the way they get paid is at the end of the case. So typically, sometimes they may ask students to help out with the hard costs. So it's usually like 500 bucks to file a case. If you do a deposition, there's hard costs associated with that. But for the most part, they assume the cost of doing the case. And it's always helpful in getting really good lawyers if we can show them that, um, you know, that plaintiffs have won every single case that has been decided on the merits. So they've lost some when the lawyer doesn't get class action status and the students graduate, they've lost some of those, right? So if they mess up on procedural grounds, but, but the ones that are decided on the merits, plaintiffs have won, again, the law is crazy good for plaintiffs, okay? So you, the, the, the steps are, you want you need to get with an attorney. They're gonna ask you, uh, they're gonna ask the students for certain facts for them to swear in front, okay? But just so you'll know, because a lot of students wanna know this is, well, you know, are they gonna find out about, uh, you know, that I was drinking too much last weekend? They don't care about that. It doesn't have to do with opportunities to participate in sports, they don't care about, you know, usually people like, oh, I've got this something that I'm nervous about. No, they don't care. So don't worry about any of that. All right, next. Good job, Mel. How much will it cost a student to take legal action? How long will the process take? Usually it doesn't cost anything for the student to take legal action. How long does the process take? Honestly, it depends 100% on the school. On, you know, do they have this reaction of, oh my God, you got us. Or do they have the 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 issue of um, you know they're going to fight every every single step. It also depends on who the insurance carrier is. If the insurance carrier demands that the school settles the case really quickly, then it usually does. So you, you just you honestly don't know. Um, the longest case that I know of is uh, it took it was a high school case in the Michigan High School Athletic Association. It took eleven years, eleven years. So my friend did the case. And imagine getting 11 years worth of work in one check at the end of 11 years. Fastest is like two weeks. Will schools retaliate against a student who files legal action? And will the students end up being investigated with the other side digging into her social media accounts and personal life? Okay, retaliation is equally as protected as the sex discrimination itself, meaning that if the school retaliates, that's just as bad as if they discriminated against in the first place. I've actually had several cases 
where it was easier to prove the retaliation than it was to prove the initial case. So, and schools and lawyers all know how easy it is to prove retaliation. So they usually don't. Like people, people are scared that they're going to lose connection with their school or that they're, they're not going to get the letters of recommendation or something. It just doesn't happen. I mean, and one of the things that we want to do as part of this process is have people who've already gone through the process describe what it was like for them to go through and honestly, how proud they are of themselves for having gone through this process because they creating generations of change for athletes who come behind them. Hi, Nancy. My question is, are there success stories for this form of legal action? Like I was saying, they're all success stories. Like the plaintiffs win all the time. Um, you know, if you bring a claim and you've got the facts and law on your side, it's kind of like the dice are loaded before you bring the claim. So um, yeah, there's plenty of success stories out there. And in the Cohen versus Brown case is one example. They have plaques up to Amy Cohen, one of the main uh, plaintiffs. There are plenty of success stories and they know what, what their willingness to step on the line did for future generations. The answer is um, is champion women. So we we have the network of attorneys. There are some attorneys that I'll, I'll um, that are actually pretty well known, but I would suggest that you not go to them. So please go to us. We know who the good ones are. We don't have any financial stake at all, but we we know who the good ones are, and we know who the ones that won't uh, that 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 uh, you know go the the cheap route, if you will. One of, the case, one of the cases that is already settled, um, they, the, the plaintiff's attorney agreed that the school would pick a, uh, a, a person, a, another attorney to come in and do a Title IX evaluation of the school. Well, guess what? The person that they hired works for schools and has been telling schools essentially how to cheat. And so they're never like, you just wasted $200,000. Can male students sue to support the rights of women? The answer is no. Like, like it needs to be women who are suing uh, to be free. But what the men can do is it really helps to say, have like the men's lacrosse team put out a statement saying they're being supportive of the legal action that women are taking, right? Or the men's basketball team or the football team or baseball team or right, what, whatever the sport is for them to say that they're supportive of what it is that the women are doing. It's really important. 